And just to jump right in today, our first speaker is Jack Davis. Uh, Jack is the SDSU Extension Crops Business Management Field Specialist. His extension responsibilities consist of programming in areas of farm financial analysis and strategic planning for family businesses. And he also focuses on crop budgets and costs of production. Um, and today, Jack will be talking about 2022 profits, realign for success, a look at input costs. And with that, you can go ahead and take it away. Oh, yeah, okay. I jumped ahead. Anyway, that's uh, contact information. And yeah, we're going to take a look at some input costs. I got mostly corn, so we'll see how we do here and time wise. But um, then I got some other things to share financially and also on renewable diesel, um, what that looks like if, if you haven't heard about that. And if you have heard more about it, um, I'd be interested in the comments. So one thing that I do in, in my work is uh, work with uh, what's called the FinBen database. And this is farmers that are part of a record keeping group and then they submit to this and the, the database is housed at University of Minnesota. And I pool uh, farms from Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota and Nebraska. And what we're looking at here is those farms that were 2000 to 5,000 acre crop farms in 2020. And then I have them separated out into um, a couple different or three different quintals. They have it in, in quintals and I pick the low as far as net profit goes, the upper, which would be 60 to 80, and then the high 20% for net profit. And just looking at some different characteristics of, of each of those. So we can see, um, mouse go here. This, this would be our low profit group, uh, number of acres that they farm, and then the percent that's owned. Uh, for all the groups that are in this, even when I, I also show it here coming up for a thousand to 2000 acre crop farms, and most of them are in that 15 to 25% as far as land ownership. Uh, one, one thing that did kind of surprise me in this was the investment per acre in machinery was higher for our high um, 20% in other years that that's reversed. It was just interesting that it was um, higher for the high profit group in, in, this, in this set of data for 2020. Uh, yields were many years, the yields are not much different between the, the operations. In 2020, they were quite different between our low and our, our top end. Um, many years, even the low or high will have a higher yield than the, than the high end. And uh, same on soybean yield, uh, prices uh, were better um, all the way around. It looks like on the, on the high profit group. I think one of the big things to take away from this, uh, there are a couple things uh, we'll drop down in, in the big one, one big one is the operating expense ratio. And that's calculated by taking total farm expenses minus depreciation minus interest, and then dividing it by total sales or gross sales for, for the farm. And you'd like to see that probably definitely below 70% um, in 65 or lower is better. And as we can see, that high profit group has got that down around 61% uh, for, for the year of 2020. So that's, that's really good. Another, another way to think of that ratio is that's the number of dollars. So it takes, uh, or cents, takes for this middle group, it takes 66 cents about, or 65 if we round, round it down, 65 cents to produce a dollar of sales. Another way to think of that is it be, there'd be 35 cents left over out of each dollar of sales 
to cover our interest, our principal, uh, depreciation, which is not a cash cost, but you know, reinvestment for machinery, and then also take our, our draw out of there if we weren't paying salaries to ourselves. So that's another way to think of it. So you can see when that starts pushing above 70%, and especially up in that 80%, it's just really hard to, to make a, a profit. I mean, you, everything is squeezed out and, and it's tough. The other thing to pick up from this set of numbers is, um, and I'll have a, a graph at the, after I get through with these sets showing that difference, but the change in earned net worth. So if they were able to continue at that level, that um, 13%, it, you know, um, there's a, what's called a rule of 72. And if you divided that 13 into 72, that would be the number of years that it would take to double if they were able to continue at that level. So if we used uh, a, a 10 or 11, it's a little under seven, seven years and they could their operation we would be doubled in in size uh, staying with that same group uh, just kind of looking at their their total gross sales um, probably a big one here is a term debt coverage which just is a ratio that measures the ability of the farm to cover all its expenses uh, what it's taking out for um, farmer withdraw or, or or owner owner you know if it's not in the salary expense so withdraws and then its ability to cover the term debt that it has left you, you it, so below one they are not covering that um, you'd like to see that at one and a half to two for sure so you can see our upper level and high level have a really good job of covering those debt payments that they have out there. So they're they're properly structured, let's say, uh, for their debt that they are carrying and they're able to meet those payments, uh, it seems like easily by this ratio in that year. Uh, and you can see here a debt to assets, that's just comparing the two. So uh, in this case, the, the lenders or creditors own as much or a little more than the owner themselves. They have as much money into the operation as the owners do on this low 20. Uh, 40 starts to challenge a little bit, but these guys are able to, in this year, we're able to operate pretty well. And third, that 30 to 40 is probably a comfortable range to stay. Um, sometimes when you're expanding, you know, it, it takes on a little more than that. And, and it gets riskier for you as, as the operator. <clears throat> Current ratio is just, uh, let me go back, uh, debt to asset. Um, measure in measuring, can we meet our current expenses with the current assets that, that we have? So, uh, Another way to look at that is working capital to gross. So what we're looking at is working capital, which is current assets minus current liabilities and dividing that by gross sales then. <clears throat> Another good measure for an individual farm is how much working capital do I have per crop acre? So here they're at 250, they were there they were four, 460. So almost enough working capital to, to put their crop in or very close on um, you know, buying those inputs for that high profit group in this, in this set of data. So just same, same thing, just switched it out to 1,000 to 2,000 acre crop farms. And in this set of data, there's probably about 3,000 farms that are in this total uh, when, when it queried that. I thought it was interesting how much our uh, machinery investment went up. We do own a, a greater percentage of the acres by, by a little bit through this group. And again, their, that high was, was higher than, than the other two. And that hasn't uh, been in every year. Uh, yields again were, were up for, for, the, for the high profit group compared to say other years. 
Uh, price was not a lot different. I guess we are on our wheat price, uh, fairly even on the bean price and, and close on corn. But I think again, we come back down to that operating expense ratio and this, this middle group that I have here, you know, was that you had it under that 65, was at 64% and the high profit group was under, under 60. So really able to be very efficient with the use of their operating expenses in those producing dollars of, of sales. And then just um, looking at the same, same stuff, uh, working capital to gross. Uh, one measure where a person would want that to be is, is right around 30 to 35% uh, of, of gross sales is one way to look at. Some measure it as a percent of their operating expenses. That's another good way to, to measure it if you were looking to use that ratio to monitor on your own operation. Again, uh, the upper section or that middle for this group has right around $300 of working capital and the high profit group had, had double of that. So just taking that net worth growth uh, due to change in earned net worth. And just wanted to, to show that here. I started them all out at, at the same. I just picked one of the sets that where their net worth was when they started. And that was right around that 3 million mark. <clears throat> and we can see that if we're on the high group is that 17% that they were able to put back into their farm. And what I wanted to highlight was here in, in five years, a well, little less than five years where that operation is able to double its net worth to, to 6 mil. So, and then it just happened, it happens again. Uh, when we get out to 12. So you can just see how fast their growth can go when they're able to retain that um, in the business. Now, those are probably exceptional uh, levels, but you, you sure, sure makes a difference in what can happen and the growth compared to one that's only able to retain 3%. I just wanted to highlight that and how it looked on, on a graph. Uh, last week, uh, January 12th, we had the, the WASD report. Um, we're just going to look at, at beans today. Uh, this is world. And it was positive, really, for, for uh, prices for soybeans. They're kind of neutral to negative on corn. But I think the, maybe the, the soybean issue and the issues going on in Argentina could, could help pull those uh, corn prices up too. <clears throat> so um, here is the crop that we just finished. The January um, final production report would, would have that information. And here is the forecast for the one that's, uh, that we're working on and using up now in the, in the US anyway. So these are changes from the December report. So it's down by 9 million from December. And here is changes from the last year's report. So I think the, the big takeaways was that from December's, uh, it, we, the world was down about that 9.2 million ton. So that was positive for, for beans. Uh, Brazil showing their issues with uh, some of it being too dry, some of it being too wet. Brazil is still set for a record area of production. They, they've increased that and record production. So even with the drought, in some lower estimates of, of production is still high. So the, we are probably in a weather market when, when Brazil's looking uh, hot and dry or too wet if, it, if they're getting to harvest. Um, 
th- those types of things. The weather in, in Brazil and South America will have uh, consequences to the market at, at this point. So probably key here is that was positive that our ending stocks went down substantially from both from December report and also last year. So just looking at the US one and where we ended up, they lowered uh, harvested acres a little bit, increased yield just a, a little bit. They added a little, um, looks like a little bit to uh, beginning stocks. Uh, so production then was was up, the total supply was up. <clears throat> and also then our stocks to use ratio had increased. I think what's key there though, is we're below that 10%. And when we are at that level, when we have hiccups in the world or in the US, as far as production goes, prices will react more because we're at that lower stocks to use or below 10%. So we're in a low stocks to use type time frame. This is just showing what the industry expectations were. So the industry is uh, pooled and, and these are the industry expectations. So traders and what the industry expected it, the production to be at and where NAS reported it on the day of those reports. So in our November one, we can see that we, uh, the net, the, all the industry was above where NASA had ex, uh, ended up reporting. And on our final one, where the industry was pre, uh, pretty well split or the NAS estimate split was, or was in the middle of what the industry had expected. So that really no difference there. Sometimes when it gets way out of whack like this one, or even down here, you can see those big jumps in, in the market because the market was leaning the other way from what the NAS estimate was. Now I'm going to switch and talk a little bit about um, renewable diesel. This is different than biodiesel. And you've maybe heard about it. It's kind of uh, being talked about at all the winter seminars and and was this last fall some. One of the things that is positive for the use of renewable diesel is it's it can it's used as what's called a drop-in fuel so it can go right into the fuel it doesn't have to be blended to be used such as biodiesel so that makes it positive and the fuel industry if you want to call it that is is behind it then Uh, another big thing that is behind the use of this or similar to renewable diesel is jet fuel and jet fuel wants to clean up or become more environmentally friendly. And this may be a way for for them to do it. But we're way, we're way behind on capacity if, of, of soybeans, and then there's a lot of plants that are in the planning and building stages. So here's what was um, available as of, Uh, 2021, and this is from the Energy Information uh, Association, and that's a good place to get information on renewable uh, uses of of fuel and just regular fuel information if you're you're interested in reading more about it. So we had about 900 million gallons uh, available, and here then, and I'll show a chart of this too, is uh, the expansions that are in place, uh, some that are converting over to producing this, others that are under construction, and then others that are planned. So you can see how it's increasing from that 900 million, or just call it a, a billion gallons, 
up up to the six. So that's a that's a crazy increase if all of these uh, get put in place. Now, not all of that will come from soybean oil. It comes from other uses of oil, including even tallow and um, distillers corn oil and and used um, uh, cooking oil. So there's a lot of different places that, that it can come from. This is just a chart uh, of the demand that would be needed as the increase, projected increases, if everything was put in place um, and producing at 100% capacity. That's probably not gonna happen, but it just shows where the potential is for the increase in, in this. And this is that same thing, uh, just probably splitting it out a little bit. Um, so what's current and then in the shade of red in construction and then those that are announced. They're not expecting it to maybe get that far. Some are saying, you know, it's, it's well above six. Some are saying four. Other estimates are putting it even at, at two. But if you take it from six even to three, that's still a, a big demand increase if that, even that much is put in place for renewable diesel. Here is where it's currently um, taken from. So even corn oil makes up 15% canola, grease, tallow, and then soybean oil about 50%. One thing that's interesting is that we in the US, as far as our cooking oil, we, we use all that. Um, so when demand for renewable diesel, the cooking oil or soybean oil, when that goes up, <clears throat> though, that has to probably be imported into the United States or it has to be taken from some other source. That's what I have on, on beans. I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down and share some rent things that it probably applies here. <clears throat> One of the things I did was take cash rents and compared it to uh, corn yields. And was taken from these different counties. And I think the thing to pick up here is which, which would just make uh, sense that Moody and Lincoln tend to be in this upper range of, of where that is at, and as you get west and maybe north and more risk that is is in production, that those are lower. Is is it? I think it just showed that it was uh, kind of common sense. And here's just another way to to look at it using those those same counties. Let me go down. One more thing I wanted to share with you guys. And that was just, I get asked questions on how, how is this high priced land, uh, how does it work? Well, uh, first off, it probably takes a lot of cash to, to make it work and buying it. But here's just an example on how it might be for an investor or a return as, as an investment. And I just took um, gross crop sales of 900 for corn and 650 on soybeans. Said you were in a 50% rotation. There was what I used for non-land costs, you know, just averaging them out. Here's what I used um, for, for rent then and leaving us $250 net. So if property tax were estimated at 30, the land had cost uh, 12,000, 
that's giving a cash return of say one and a half to two percent. But the annual increase in our survey for land has been eight eight percent. I'm not saying that's going to continue, but that's what it has been since '91. So you add those two together, and over its life, it makes a pretty good return. Even if we divide that annual increase by half, it's still a pretty good return compared to other investments that are currently out there. Now, the big thing that changes that is probably our discount rate or interest rate. So as those increase, we would look for land values to, to decrease. That's what I have. I'll stop there. All right, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to place those in the Q&A. Um, and I will go ahead and share the CCA credit with everyone. I think the big thing this year with, uh, with our production costs increases is that the guys will just have more at risk. So uh, trying to get that same profit and, and you just have more at risk. So that's, that's the challenge. And it, it gets frustrating as a, as a producer, as a production operator, that when you have a chance for good profits, that everybody wants their piece of it. Um, the seed guy, the chemical guys, fertilizer, machinery, it all takes, takes a jump. All right. And if there's no other questions, I can stop screen sharing and introduce our next speaker. All right. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. I'll hang around and... All right, so our next speaker today is Connie Strunk. Um, she got her bachelor's in agricultural education from SDSU, as well as her master's in plant pathology from SDSU. And she is currently our extension field specialist in plant pathology. And today, Connie will be talking about fungicide considerations. So take it away. Thank you, Shelby. Wanted to make sure everybody can see the slides. Yep, we can see them. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about fungicide considerations, a few things to kind of think about. Just give me a moment. Ah, all right. So when you think about fungicides, you know, the thought always comes into play. When is it profitable to apply fungicides? Well, generally, what we find is that if you are in the same crop or have no rotation, right? So if you're corn on corn, soybean on soybean, if you're in that same crop setup and have no rotation, we see some benefit to fungicide. If you're in a minimum tillage with crop residue that's still on the surface, we see some benefit to applying that rotation. If there's disease susceptibility to your, to your hybrid cultivar variety, through like your selection process, if there's some disease susceptibility there, that is when a fungicide could be profitable. If you have a field history with moderate plant diseases, so like you've scouted, you've had a history of disease, that's when it may pay to be applying that fungicide. But the biggest one that connects all of it together is that prolonged wet, humid weather. Disease needs some moisture, whether it's rainfall or humidity or dew, to have that sporulation process take hold within our plants. So that there are some things to think about when we talk about the profitability of applying fungicides. When we think about disease, you know, we talk about how does it develop. This is kind of just a quick basic of how disease develops, and this applies to our fungal diseases. We need our host plant, our plant that 
whatever we've planted out in the field. In this case, we're talking about this week, we'll use soybeans. So we got our soybean plants. Then we have our pathogen or, you know, brown spot, cross but leaf spot, any of our fungal pathogens that are residing out there. We need that environment, that perfect opportunity. So we need that moisture, that humidity do rainfall to make disease happen. So we like to say the perfect triangle. When these stars align or overlapped, we get that perfect opportunity for disease. So again, depends on the weather, the host crop in our inoculum. So meaning our viable spores. When we utilize a fungicide, we're protect, protecting the plant by spraying those leaves and the stems from getting that fungal disease pathogen if we're more on the preventative side. If we're seeing disease, disease out there, then we're applying a fungicide to be more on that curative side of things. But anyhow, it's a little bit of how disease takes hold or happen. When we look at a plant, I know that we're talking about soybeans this week, but just bear with me for a moment. When we look on the plant, on the picture here, if you see where the red is, it indicates like where disease is taking hold, gives you a few things to think about. If we're seeing it on the roots or like those lower stems, inner nodes, generally it's going to be seed borne or soil borne. That's where we're seeing that disease come from. If we're finding it on the lower leaves of the plant. So, you know, first example within the roots could be SCN attacking the roots, could be Phytophthora, SDS, any of the other, you know, root rot diseases, right? Attacking those roots. If we're seeing it on the lower leaves of the plant on the second picture here, could be brown spot, like a residue borne disease is where we tend to see those residue borne diseases attack those lower leaves first because of that dew, humidity, rain, causing the drops to come down, having that go up into the canopy where that sporulation will occur within having resulting in disease pressure. With the upper canopy or at that flowering time frame could be diseases that are blowing, blowing in or moving or only infect during that time frame, which is the case of white mold. So just kind of where you're seeing disease on the plant and when it moved in, in addition to growth stage are some things to think about when we make a decision on whether or not a fungicide is needed. So as we kind of go through some factors that influence our yield gain by the use of fungicides fungicide, again, is that susceptibility of the variety, you know, what is the level of disease that we're seeing out, out there results in how susceptible our variety is, how much inoculum is present or in, in the area, how conducive our weather is, meaning is it warm, is it wet, is it cool, is it wet, or is it hot and dry? And then the big kicker, you know, is really the growth stage of the crop when that disease starts to develop whether or not we'll have a yield gain or a yield benefit by utilizing that fungicide. So as we look at foliar fungicides, you have to keep in mind that they are a chemical compound that were developed to control plant fungal diseases. So our fungal or fungus diseases, our fungicides are applied usually on the leaves of our soybean plants with our fungicides. They control fungal pathogens mainly by blocking the electron transfer and a respiration. So what we find with the strobilurins, with the FRAC code 11, interfering with the integrity of cell membranes, such as with the triazoles, the FRAC 3, blocking enzyme activity in the fungal cells, such as our SDHIs, which is like that FRAC 7, and binding to several sites in the cell, with the multi-mode of action or like the FRAC app. So some different ways our fungicides work. We also have, you know, our mode of action and timing, right? Our systemic is generally is after initial symptoms. Local systemic is before disease develops or contact, you know, before our disease develops. All of our fungicides are either a single or a multi-mode of action. Again, the contact, they're more of a protectant or a preventative form. Our systemic are absorbed. 
within the plant and they can either move short or long distance depending on what fungicide is used. So they're more of that penetrative or curative and they really target, those systemics really target the fungal diseases growing inside the plants. So, you know, when you're looking at a fungicide or a fungicide label, you're going to find some product information. It's going to tell you, you know, in this case, this example of Prosaro, it tells us that it's a broad spectrum systemic fungicide, tells us what it, you know, what diseases it would go for. It has a message about resistance management, that it's a group through fungicide. And it says fungal pathogens are known to develop with repeat, repeated use of the same mode of action. So it's wanting you to rotate that mode of action. So those are some things that, you know, you'll find it on the fungicide label, but things to think about when you're making your selection, really wanting you to rotate your mode of action when you utilize, utilize a fungicide, because we want to prevent fungicide resistance from developing. With um, fungicide resistance, you know, like how does it develop? Well, it is when, uh, when the population changes from being sensitive to a fungicide to becoming less sensitive to that fungicide. So in this first little picture here, we have two little red dots. Those are plants that have some or have some that's the disease out there found on plant but they are no longer sensitive to that fungicide so they were not controlled when that fungicide application occurred whereas all the other blue colored ones were controlled by putting that fungicide out there if we repeatedly use that same active ingredient with you know within our fungicide we tend to see more more of the population make a shift or a change, so they start to become less sensitive to that fungicide. Over time, that population continues to build up the more that mode of action is utilized, so it becomes more and more less sensitive, becoming where we have that population switch to being sensitive and controlled with the fungicide to now it is fungicide resistant and we put out that fungicide and we see a very low response to utilizing a fungicide out there. So again, we really want to stay away from repeated application of utilizing the same active ingredients. So we wanna rotate those modes of action or those different frac codes if we can. We want to look at even utilizing a premix or like a mixture of different modes of action. That way, the sensitivity is not built up or that way it doesn't become insensitive to that, fun, to that fungicide. So do not use a single mode of action. That's continuously. So like season after season, we want you to rotate or use, you know, a mixture of fungicide. But really, you know, it starts before that you know, restrict the number of treatments that you are applying out in the field. Don't apply it just because it's cheaper. You can, you know, apply that fungicide when it's strictly necessary. And then the other one is use the recommended rate on the label. You know, every label is going to have a range or an amount that they state. That's not, a just, that's not just a suggestion saying, well, we didn't really know what to use, so we put this here. There's been repeated studies done to come up with the rate that best controls that pathogen. You would use a lower rate if, you've not, if you have some resistance or tolerance in your cultivar or variety that you've selected. You would use a higher rate if you have a susceptible variety cultivar planted out in the out in the field especially you know kind of look as to what diseases you've had but follow what that label says the other part is other than having things properly id to make sure it is a fungal pathogen you want to avoid applying a fungicide if it's too late for the growth stage 
and I'll have an example of that, but the, the quick one would be white mold. It's a disease controlled by a, fun by a fungicide because it's a fungal pathogen, but it infects during the flowering time frame. And so the application window for that one is at R1 stage of growth. If we wait until we start to see beginning pod, we've missed that application window. You're putting a fungicide out there that now is not going to control or help the white mold situation, but you've opened up for some resistance to build within, within that pathogen. So we want to avoid applying fungicides too late in that growth stage. Again, with, with our fungicide resistance, one of the things that you can do is go out and scout your field about two weeks after you applied that fungicide to really assess if your fungicide is working. You know, are you getting the desired results that you had wanted? Is that pathogen being controlled or prevented? If not, you know, if you're seeing something, take those samples, get them assessed to make sure it is in fact what you think it is. Because some of our diseases, they look alike. It's very easy to misdiagnose one disease for something else. Our fungicides are only effective and only work against fungal diseases. So if it is a bacterial disease, it's not going to control that plant pathogen. So scouting is key. Sending in a sample or calling to have the field look at also is a good tool to have to make sure the resistance doesn't develop. And if you have the ability to leave a strip in the field untreated, meaning don't apply the fungicide there, that way you can compare whether disease, what disease occurred and how bad it was and how it overall affected your yield. In South Dakota, we do have fungicide resistance to a disease known as frog eye leaf spot here in soybean. It is fungicide resistant to the strobilurins, the strobes. With this disease, it is easily mistaken for an adjuvant burn, but the symptoms are circular to angular lesions. They have dark brown spots with a narrow, dark, reddish brown margin around it. The center of that lesion becomes ashen gray and over time kind of becomes light gray. These lesions may grow together or coalesce to form larger lesions leading to leaf def defoliation. Frog eye leaf spot can also be seen on the pods, stems, and petioles. So it's not just on the leaves alone. So it can be quite evasive when it does move in and take hold. How we manage frog eye, you know, starting with the seed selection, look for varieties with resistance or tolerance to frog eye, practice crop rotation. And if you can do tillage, if it's practical for your operation, encourage you to do that to help reduce the inoculum because frog eye is a residue borne disease. But don't it's not, if you don't do tillage, it's okay. There are other things that you can still work with. Again, work with that variety selection, but also, you know, we do have fungicides and you're able to utilize them. They're a great tool in our toolbox. We just want to prevent that fungicide resistance from developing. So the ideal time to apply a fungicide for frog eye is that R2 to R5 stage of growth. So that full flower to the beginning of seeds, seed fill, that's when disease pressure is likely to be high, you know, our best estimate. And we ask you to alternate fungicide chemistries to avoid resistance development from occurring. Again, with soybean fungicide timings, white mold is during that R1 stage of growth, that beginning of flowering. Since that is when white mold infects the soybean plant. So there's fungicides that have specific fungicide active ingredients to target white mold. For other fungal diseases, really the best timing is the R3 to R4, but we'll give you a little bigger window, meaning that R2 to R5 with that full flower to the beginning seed, there are some benefits for following within that 
that span, but that R3, R4 is really the ideal best timing for our foliar fungal diseases. White mold, if you're not familiar, it's got the black sclerotia. Um, when it's harvested, it remains in the soil, it starts off as kind of a little mushroom. Ideal conditions allow the disease to sporulate and send on into the crop canopy, you know, so is favored when there's high humidity, those really narrow low rows, high populations, high fertility. So if we're able to kind of work with a few of them to reduce that, if you've had a history with white mold, you know, especially there's a lot of white mold up in the Brown County area. So be, you know, mindful of that if that's where you're from. With white mold, you know, fungicide is a key to really managing this disease, but it's all in the timing. If you look at the study done by Darren Mueller at Iowa State, we look at the amount of severity of white mold here on the left of the screen, the amount of white mold that they found out in the field. The first one here, non-treated, means there was no fungicide applied out in the field. And it was at an index of 46. Now, when, we, when they applied fungicide to reduce the white mold, at that R1, so at that proper timing to prevent infection from taking place, you know, there was minimal white mold picked up for severity out there in the plots. When they waited just to R3, so waited for flowering to be done, starting to see the pod set, that first pod, they applied a fungicide. And if you notice, the severity of white mold is almost as if they didn't apply a fungicide out there. You know, 43, 46, very close to the same. So again, make a huge case for applying fungicide to control white mold, but timing of application is key. So we want to apply white mold at that R, apply fungicide for white mold control at that R1 stage of growth. When we talk about fungicide, some factors that influence yield gain is the type of disease being controlled. Is it a heavy leaf spot such as frog eye, or does it produce some lighter leaf spots such as brown spot? Those are things to think about. You know, the timing of your fungicide, are you gonna be using a preventative or are you using a curative? And then the fungicide efficacy, you know, for example, there's many different fungicides that, you know, control different diseases, but it's when you apply them, such as the case if we were applying for or trying to prevent head scab or fusarium head scab in wheat, we don't want to use the strobilurins because it increases the dawn level, right? So we want to really look at the efficacy, want to look at how it's going to perform. When we talk about the response to fungicide application, the level of the disease development depends on, again, the susceptibility, what the weather is. So is it warm, wet, humid? You know, had it rained, is it going to rain? You know, what is that rainfall and humidity? Is there early infection? Are we finding things early? So like the lower leaves in the case of soybeans, is it a high crop residue, no rotation, high plant density? Some practices that we can use to minimize fungicide resistance is if a fungicide is applied to monitor for effective control. You know, again, we encourage leaving a strip for comparison, tank mixing our fungicides or premix the products with different modes of action. Follow that label and agronomic practices to reduce the need for fungicides. Oftentimes I get a question, you know, is a fungicide needed after a hail event? Well, I just want to remind you that a fungicide application cannot recover yield potential lost due to hail damage. What a fungicide does is it protects the yield potential by reducing the disease pressure that's out there. And this is looking at the fungal diseases, because what happens when it hails? It, you know, thumps down on the leaves, tears the leaves, maybe puts a bruise, bruises the stems, breaks off the stems of the soybean plants, right? Causes wounds. Well, after hail, we tend to find diseases that are favored by wounding. They tend to be more of the bacterial nature of diseases. So in soybeans, it'd be that bacterial blight, bacterial pustule. Corn, we see more of the goss as well. See smut, some of the stock reds. The fungicides 
are just not effective against controlling those pathogens that cause these diseases. Where a fungicide does control diseases are ones that do not require the wounds for infection. So, you know, we've been talking about brown spot or frog eye leaf spot, and then brown spot and soybean. They don't need a wound for infection. They need that right environment. They need the inoculum and that susceptibility of that plant for that disease to take hold. So applying a fungicide just because it hails isn't going to prevent some of these yield limiting diseases that we find year in, year, in, year out, if you will, throughout South Dakota, if our environment is setting us up for disease potential. So again, these diseases influence yield response more so than hail damage. Um, real briefly, you know, the ideal timing for corn for fungicide is at the VT to R1 stage of growth. I would caution if you're applying a fungicide for late maturing or late planted corn to keep an eye out for southern rust. That is one disease that, you know, does not overwinter here. It blows up. We tend to see it late August into September, closer to black layer for us. And it's not a yield limiting disease. But on some of these late maturing, late planting fields that when, if southern rust moves in and it's before that black layer, we could see a huge, huge, huge yield potential being lost due to that disease. With wheat fungicides, the ideal timing would be we focus on the flag leaf and heading or flowering really to protect that yield ask you to look at different scouting monitoring devices that are there for you, such as the climate um, small grains tools and the scab monitor to help prevent that. And we question usually comes up, you know, do I need to apply a fungicide at tillery? Because they like want to put it on to prevent it. Well, if you're under no-till, so if you're doing no-till or if you're wheat on wheat, or if you're seeing stripe rust develop early, then that's when we would um, recommend having a fungicide applied at tillery. Real briefly with seed treatments of fungicides, again, the protectants or contacts, they're effective only on the seed surface. They generally have a short residual. They focus on seed surface borne pathogens, have some level of control of soil borne pathogens. If they're that systemic, so they meaning they're absorbed, into that emerging seedling, because you know the seed treatments need to come up and out of the ground, they in inhibit or kill the fungus inside and outside plant tissues. There's you know various different uh, seed treatments and with fungicides that work as systemic. Unfortunately, no seed treatment is going to be the cure all for all diseases. So you need to have a pretty good field history and conditions of what you've had growing in your area in your field. And then other things to think about is, are you taking this crop for seed production and are you following the same crop? So if you're soybean on soybean, you know, some things to think about in use of seed treatments is the, you know, field no-till. So you have more of those residue borne diseases potentially being out there. Will planting be done early, more of in that cooler wet soils where some of the diseases like to take hold. And then you're planting population. When you work with seed treatment, um, some things to kind of ask yourself, you know, was the disease accurately diagnosed? If you're starting to see disease out there. Did you use the right seed treatment? Like, did you make the right choice? So is your seed treatment working for you? And did you apply the right, was the right amount of active ingredient applied out there? This is just an example of different diseases with different seed treatments, showing that there's a lot of different seed treatments that are that have with fungicides, but they're not going to cure, unfortunately, or prevent all the different diseases that we have out there. Just to want to remind you that <clears throat> the seed treatments will not compensate for poor quality seed. They do not last the entire season. They're like 14, 21 days. Basically, they need to just get up and out of the ground to kind of protect that plant to get up and out of that ground. And they do not control all seed and seedling diseases. 
you know, seed treatments do give you a good base, you know, really give you a good set of protection to get that plant up and out of the ground. But if it's poor seed to begin with or very susceptible to diseases, it's not going to be the cure-all. It's just one method of prevent of trying to prevent and help your plants. Real briefly, a couple of diseases that we see depending on weather conditions. So this is more of the warm, warm wet is stem canker. Um, it is more at that petiole phase and goes around the stem in different colorations here. Management of stem canker is selecting tolerant cultivars, utilizing rotations and adequate fertility. Another disease that's more of that root rot, but they both attack, you know, all season is Phytophthora. It can take out seeds or take out the seedlings before they emerge or as the season progresses, it's got that chocolate brown lesion at the soil line. We manage Phytophthora through resistant cultivars, combination of different RPS genes, looking at improving drainage because it likes more of that lower area or compacted areas. And then again, utilizing a seed treatment to kind of help it get up and out of that ground. Another soil borne pathogen is sudden death syndrome. You'll notice the green veins is kind of referred to as a flashing with the yellow and then the necrosis or the dying of the brown tissue, but the leaf veins remain green. Sometimes if it's been a little bit moist, you can find a blue mycelium on the roots, but not all the time. If you cut through the stem, you often will see like a white interior that would be the sudden death if you're seeing you know rotted brown that's not sudden death within that pith how we manage sds is plant tolerant cultivars plant in warm well-drained soils and utilize a fungicide seed treatment um, scn is not a fungal pathogen but since i was supposed to talk a little bit about disease um, just want to talk about a pest here. It is an unsegmented roundworm underground. It does, this infestation really can reduce your yields huge. You can pull up and look at a field, scout through a field that looks great, green growing, not seeing anything wrong. And you could be having up to 30% yield loss due to this pest. Oftentimes when you really start to see the stunting roller coaster yellowed appearance occurring out in the field, you're at about a 70% yield loss or more occurring. SCN has been identified in 32 counties here in the state, started in Union County and it's worked its way up north, heavily here on the eastern part of the state where we grow soybeans, but it's branching out west. If you have a county that hasn't turned color, most likely SCN has made it there. We just have not found that sample sent to the diagnostic clinic yet or have not scouted that field ourselves. Um, with the soil sample, it is free for South Dakota growers, so really encourage you to sample for SCN if you've had it in the past, sample to see if what you're doing is working for you. Currently, it's no cost by a grant from the South Dakota Research and Promotion Council, so it's a great deal for South Dakota growers to do that. How we manage SCN is by planting resistant cultivars, utilizing like the PIA8788 and Peking, but also rotating, like not relying on only the same resistant cultivar. We want to rotate our resistant cultivars. We want to practice crop rotation. So rotating away from soybean, going into corn has the largest mortality for SCN, but staying, like if you went into an alfalfa or other operation that takes it out a couple of years, really greatly reduces the numbers too, because these little cysts can have three, 300 to 500 eggs inside, and they can remain in your ground in your soil for about 10 years or longer. Um, if you have SCN and the numbers are high, we recommend utilizing the nematicide seed treatments. And the biggest one here would also be controlling weeds, as weeds can be a host for SCN. So with disease management, it starts with you. I'm gonna really encourage you to know your field history of diseases, scout, keep notes. Know the variety hybrid disease package that you've made for your selection for the growing season. As you're out there with the weather, you know, keep track of your weather, you know, scout accordingly. 
If a fungicide is to be applied, remember the timing and mode of action of the fungicide are highly important when you go to make that application. And then really, if you utilize a fungicide, really encourage you to scout about that two weeks after to note whether or not that fungicide is working for you and to prevent those res resistance issues. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with my contact information. And I'll turn it back to Shelby. All right, thank you, Connie. So we will get that poll for you guys. And then if you wanna stop screen sharing, Connie, then I will go ahead and throw up that credit. Right. All right, and thanks again, everyone, for attending today. And please join us next week when we start to cover sunflowers.